This is the third seminar in my Brief History of Philosophy series, and the, the, the original digital tapes were destroyed, so I'm just recreating this very briefly. Um, it'll be uh, complete as far as the material goes, but it won't have the interplay between me and the audience. So this is seminar three. The main topic is the great mystery redefined, the Cartesian revolution and the origins of modern, modern philosophy. The timeline goes from the alchemists to Bishop Barclay. Uh, this is the information about how to download the course materials. Uh, we had a brief hiatus. And here's the review of seminars one and two. Introduction to the Great Mystery, Ontological Dualism and Practicing Death from the Ancient Mystery Religion through Aristotle. And the second seminar, The Great Mystery Revealed, Gnosticism and the Origins of Ancient Christianity. 6000 BCE to 1274 CE. So review of seminar one. The ancient mystery religions were uh, practiced from about 6000 BCE to about 325 BCE. Uh, the basic con concepts in the ancient mystery religions were that there were secret initiation rites, that there was a dualism between cons consciousness and matter, that human souls are divine but require training here in the real world, Transmigration of the soul until training is complete, so basically reincarnation until uh, until we get it right. Enlightenment through discipline. And so they developed a series of gymnastics, yoga, tai chi, uh, the martial arts, and then they had their own versions of hypnosis, tranquility, meditation, psychoanalysis, and inside meditation. Um, there were also the mythical journeys to the underworld, which is the equivalent of practicing death. And so the descriptions of those journeys to the underworld, like Virgil's Aeneid, are metaphorical and mythical, mythological descriptions of the practice of practicing death. Pre-Socratic philosophy was from 750 BCE to 469 BCE. Um, Hesiod was a great poet, and he had the, uh, the great resurrection mythos, as well as most of the uh, ethical and moral behavioral patterns that the Greeks, that the ancient Greeks followed. Pythagoras created the terms philosopher and philosophy, lover of wisdom, um, and love of wisdom, incorporated the initiation rites and the ascetic exercises of the mystery religions into his own philosophical system. He discovered that contemplation allows the philosopher to experience directly the formal structures of physical objects. And of course, he gave us the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, um, which uh, is the, uh, the length of the isosceles triangle. Um, Heraclitus emphasized the difference between the one and the many. Um, basically, from a mystical perspective, the one is consciousness, us, we are a singular entity, and we look out upon the many, uh, the extended reality of the world itself, which is composed of an infinite number of different objects. Parmenides talked about the way of opinion, which is the way of the many, and the way of truth, which is the way of the one. Uh, ancient Greek philosophy, 469 BCE to 322 BCE, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. So Socrates in Plato, a philosopher, practices death, that's from the Phaedo 67e and following. Anamnesis, which is the recollection of past lives, that's also the Phaedo 72e and following. The theory of forms, the theory of the ideas, the Theaetetus 184 through 186. The allegory of the cave, uh, which is basically Plato's uh, description of enlightenment and the way that the masses are controlled. Um, and that was presented to us in the Republic uh, 7.514 through 7.518. And finally, the myth of Ur, which is presented in the Republic 10.614 to 10.621. Ur basically was a soldier who fell in the field of battle. And so his body was prepared for the funeral pyre. But after three days, he woke up. And he basically recounted his uh, out-of-body experience that he had while he, while he was dead. And this is a retelling of the ancient mystery religion's belief of the afterlife. Uh, basically, he describes a 
um, a scenario where the the afterlife is divided into two segments one segment of those people who are not done and need to come back again for additional lifetimes and then another smaller section of those people who have uh, become enlightened through their lifetimes and are now free of the burdens of mortality um, in the Phaedo, Socrates talks about not fearing death because he knows that he is going to be able to stay on the side of those with those people who have become enlightened, and he is looking forward to the conversations that he's going to have with those people for eternity. Uh, Aristotle talked about the concept of substance. Substances are those uh, um, entities in the in the extended world that are in, independent, that are individual, that can, that can be you know, have their own identity. He talked about the Bios Theoreticos, and he talked about Protophilosophia, first philosophy. Um, ancient Eastern philosophy from 563 BCE to 150 BCE. Um, the Buddha recognizes the existence of constant reality of suffering, pain, dissatisfaction, death, disease, so on and so forth, and he made this the foundation of his philosophical system. He also gave us concrete operational instructions on how to practice death, namely meditation, um, tranquility and inside meditation. Now Patanjali, about 150 BCE, uh, collated all of the information at the time that was known about yoga. Uh, yoga means yoking together consciousness and matter, the consciousness that you are and the body that you have. And ascesis, which is uh, asceticism, which is the generation of heat during the yoga practice. We then review the modern classification of philosophy, basically dividing philosophy into five subcategories. Metaphysics, which is the theory of being, uh, subdivided further into four subgroups. Ontology, which is the nature of reality. Teleology, which is the purpose of reality. Cosmology, which is the origin and structure of reality. And soteriology, which is salvation in the midst of reality. Epistemology is the theory of knowledge. Logic is the theory of meaning, reason, and language. Ethics is the theory of proper conduct. And aesthetics is the theory of beauty and value. Uh, the Gnostics comes from the Greek gnosis, which means knowledge. Uh, the Greek gnothi sauton means to know thyself. This was Socrates' motto. Uh, the Neoplatonists, uh, Plotinus, the Greek pl uh, Plotinus, of course, 205 CE through 270 CE, Porphyry, uh, the, his Greek name was Porphyrios, 233 CE through 309 CE, the Aeneids talks about the one, so it goes back to Parmenides, um, uh, the Greek word for the one is hen, uh, and the Greek word for, for enlightenment is henosis, unity with the one. So the practice is the unification, henosis, unity with the one, through contemplation and ecstasis, ecstasy, standing outside or next to oneself, which is exactly the same thing as practicing death through meditation, standing outside the body. Uh, the sequence of ecstasis is the material world, uh, is the, then dissolves, and then the body dissolves, and the emotions dissolve, and the thoughts dissolve, and space-time dissolves, and then we have henosis, the unity with the one. Um, so this is the Buddhist jhanas, the um, uh, the eightfold, uh, the the eightfold distancing of oneself from the real, from the the extended world. The purpose is to escape suffering in the world of becoming and to reunite with being, the world of being. So we can compare that to the Buddhist jhanas and the, med the meditative absorptions. The early Christians comes from the Greek word Christos, which means anointed one, that is someone who is anointed with oil. Um, the, the, the term comes down to us in Crisco oil, so it, it, it survives even in you know normal everyday activities in the modern world. Um, St. Augustine of Hippo, his primary idea was the indubitable foundation of knowledge, is one's own experience. He was one of the first of the empiricists. The Knights Templar, conquest of the Holy Land in 1071 CE and the initiation of the Crusades, which occurred continuously between 1095 CE and 1291 CE. The establishment of the Knights Templar occurred in 1129 CE. 
they had secret initiation rites. They were secret carriers of the Gnostic and the ancient mystery traditions. They were declared heretics in 1307 CE. Uh, the Exodus formed the foundations of the Masonic Order from about 1390 CE to its first publicly declared lodge in 1717 CE. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas reinterpreted Aristotle in terms of the Christian Orthodox theology. He wrote the Summa Theologica between 1265 CE and 1274 CE, interrupted by St. Thomas's death and so incomplete. Summa Theologica means compendium of theology. Set the stage for the Scholastics, the Scholastic School of Philosophy from 1300 CE to 1600 CE, when Descartes became the first of the modern philosophers. So our class discussion of the time, what is the purpose of Eastern and Western philosophy from their beginnings in 6000 BCE to the 14th century CE? And the hint was to escape what? Basically suffer. So now the overview of seminar three, we're going to uh, look at the historical context. Um, the alchemists, the Rosicrucians, Rene Descartes, Benedict or Baruch de Spinoza, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, and George Bishop Barclay. The historical context of this time frame, the Black Death occurred from 1348 CE to 1350 CE. The printing press was invented somewhere around 1440 CE. The Spanish Inquisition reigned from 1480 CE to 1834 CE. This was the rise of the guilds, especially the Masonic guilds. Challenges to the Roman Catholic Church coming from the guilds. The beginning of the Renaissance, the 14th to the 17th century CE, and the Enlightenment in the 18th century. The alchemists have been present in all epochs and cultures. The name comes from the Arabic word al kem which means from the land of Kem, that is from the land of Egypt. Modern alchemy, the one we're familiar with, arose circa 1500 CE and ended circa 1700 CE. So all of the modern alchemical writings were published between those two dates. It combines Neoplatonism, Gnosticism, and Kabbalism. It uses astrological and chemical symbolism, and its primary symbolism was the distillation of lead into gold, which equals separating spirit from the body, which equals practicing death. This is the distillation apparatus of Zosimos of Panopolis, around 250 CE. This is a, an alchemical uh, drawing from Michael Meyer in 1618. And this is a, a, the microcosmos a diagram from 1619 by Robert Flood. The Rosicrucians, the legend that they were founded by Christian Rosenkreutz in Germany in 1407 CE. Christian Rosenkreutz's date of birth was 1378 CE, date of death 1484 CE at 106 years old. Three texts appear in the early 17th century. Fama Fraternitatis Rosae Crucis, 1614 which is the fame of the Brotherhood of the Rose Cross, Confessio Fraternitatis Rosae Crucis, 1615, Confes Confessions of the Brotherhood of the Rose Cross, and the Cumusa Hoxide Christiani Rosenkreuz, 1616, the chemical wedding, the alchemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreuz. The primary message in Latin, Jesus mihi omnia nequaquam vacuum libertas evangeliae, uh, Dei Intacta Gloria Legis Yucum, which means Jesus is everything to me, by no means empty, the freedom of the gospel, the untouched glory of God, the yoke of the law. Notice the term yoke, yogam, uh, the same root as the Sanskrit for yoga. Claims to provide a way built on, quote, esoteric truths of the past, the ancient mystery religions, which concealed from the average man, provide insight into nature, the physical universe, and the spiritual realm, unquote. Robert Flood responded to these Rosicrucian texts and to attacks against them. Rosicrucian symbols and ideas will influence the Mason, the Theosophists, and the Hermetic societies like the Golden Dawn, thus continuing the, the ancient mystery traditions from their origins, you know, 8,000 years ago to the present day. Rene Descartes was born in 1596 CE and died in 1650 CE. He is considered the founder of modern philosophy. 
He began a movement away from medieval philosophy and the scholastics by developing a philosophical method that was not based on classical ancient mystery religions, even though he appears to have been a Rosicrucian in particular or on any religion in general. This method is a systematic application of the skeptical method mentioned by St. Augustine. Uh, the two texts in which this is discussed are the Discourse on the Method, Part 4 in 1637, where he talks about methodical skepticism, which he practiced for eight years, and the Passions of the Soul, sections 31 through 34 in 1649, where he talks about the soul-body interface being at the pineal gland. So here's uh, where the pineal gland is located. Uh, Descartes believed that that was the, the locus of the interface between the body and the soul, uh, because it was singular, there was only one of them, and it was located at the exact center of the mass of the brain. Benedict de Spinoza, born 1632 CE and died 1677 CE, uh, considered to be the first truly modern philosopher, he completed Descartes' movement away from medieval philosophy and religion. He redefined the concept of God as nature, that is the one perfect extended thinking thing, he dissolved the Cartesian mind-body dualism by postulating the existence of only one substance, namely the mind of God, of which human minds are an element based on the physical body only. Strict determinism, similar to Newton's physical determinism. Uh, Non-material substance cannot interact with material substance. This was the major criticism of Descartes' uh, dualism. Because how could a you know a non-physical, non-present, non-material substance have any kind of an effect on a material substance? Uh, so God in the mind, therefore, according to Spinoza, must necessarily be material. Uh, compare with Aristotle's conception of substantial form. Uh, this is very similar to the philosophy presented in the Hindu Vedas, about 1500 BCE to 150 BCE. Uh, that's from the Sanskrit term Veda, meaning knowledge. Spinoza ex exerted a major influence on Hegel and Nietzsche. Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz was born in 1646 CE and died in 1716 CE. He developed the infinitesimal calculus independently from Newton, building on work done by Descartes and other mathematicians. Uh, he, responded in, he, he was responding to problems with Cartesian and Spinozan systems. Um, solipsism and the interaction between mind and matter in the case of Descartes, and lack of individuation and free will in the case of Spinoza, because Spinoza systems, um, individuals are always accidental and never necessary, so never free in Spinoza system, and strict determinism denies the possibility of free will. Uh, his major works were Theodicy in 1710, where he was concerned with the existence of suffering, pain, discomfort, disease, war, um, in a world created supposedly by a loving God. Uh, his conclusion at the end of the Theodicy is that this is the best of all possible worlds that could be created, and so we need to just sort of relax into that and go with it. Uh, the Monadology was published in 1714, where he describes each human soul as a windows, windowless monad, without any interaction with other monads or the monads which comprise the material world. Uh, all the interaction is simulated and orchestrated by God. So we're basically blind. What we see is the, the will of God, the mind of God. And, and so it's a simulation created by God. And that's how we manage to, you know, to pass each other safely in lanes of traffic because the mind of God is controlling that uh, and then projecting the proper data into our minds. It's, it's a fascinating concept, uh, especially when you sit down and think about it. Uh, difficult to read, but well worth it. And, you know, Leibniz, you know, the genius just leaps out at you. Uh, George Bishop Barclay, uh, born in 1685 CE, died in 1753 CE. First of the modern idealists. In response to Descartes, Spinoza, and Leibniz, he created a new system of philosophy, which he called immaterialism but which was later termed subjective idealism. Uh, in his book, A Treatise Concerning the Principles of Human Knowledge, the primary tenet that he put forth was that essa est percipi, to be is to be perceived. 
And this is where we get that famous quotation from him, if a tree falls in the forest and no one is there to hear it, does it make a sound? That comes from the principal section 45. So he basically would say no. Um, it, it doesn't even exist without being perceived. Uh, there was also an interesting dialogue, uh, a book that he published called Three Dialogue Between Hylas and F uh, Philonus. Uh The title is interesting, well, published in 1713. The title is interesting because Hylas comes from the Greek word hule, which means matter or material, and philonous, which is Greek for the lover of mind. Uh, summary of what we've covered so far. For Western thought, the rise of rationalism, the belief that human reason can solve all problems, the decline of religion and mysticism as accepted sources of knowledge, a major emphasis on materialism and the physical sciences, instead of turning to, inward towards the soul, they now turn outwards towards the world. Ancient mystery religions go underground in the form of the Masons, the Kabbalists, the Golden Dawn, so on and so forth. Descartes' uh, methodical skepticism is a rational alternative to meditation for discovering the true nature of reality, a rational method that focuses on the world for information about the soul. No Western philosopher from this time forward will openly speak of meditation or mysticism as a valid method of inquiry. Um, uh, the ancient mystery religions, Buddhist and Gnostic, suggestion that this place is essentially hellish and requires escaping is discarded, replaced with theodicy, with, with Leibniz's theodicy, the best of all possible worlds. Uh, note that the Cartesian dualism will form the basis for all philosophical discussions from Descartes to the present time. For Eastern thought, a continuation of classical contemplative methods of inquiry, that is meditation, which turn into toward God being in the soul, and a continuation of the first unknowable truth, the existence of suffering in a fallen world. Okay, class discussion topics. What has happened here? An apparent reversal of previous philosophical positions. East and West diverging for the first time in 7,000 years. So why did that happen? Um, if Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, and Berkeley are following Plato and Aristotle, how come they are making such a radical change in direction? What is different in the origins of Eastern and Western thought that could account for this divergence? Um, and then the hint, what is the fundamental historical difference between East and West as a result of the reverence in philosophical inquiry in the 17th century? Basically, what we wanted to discuss was the concept that because of the turn towards the material world in Western philosophy, we began to be dominated by technology, whereas the Eastern world did not. It continued to be dominated by mysticism. And so you have to ask yourself the question, why was it that the United States was the one that developed nuclear weapons and not India? Um, preview of the next seminar, which uh, is The Great Mystery Abandoned, Epistemological Collapse in the Age of Skepticism and Solipsism. The timeline is David Hume to Immanuel Kant.